Thank you all very much for letting me preach today. Before I begin, I'd like to tell you what I was uh, planning on doing, what I prepared. So I have about a 10,000 word document at home. It's 20 pages and would take about an hour to read with full dramatic effect. It's an attempt at a chapter by chapter, almost verse by verse, analysis of the book of Ecclesiastes. And I thought to myself, all right, maybe that's a bit much. So I cut out a few chapters and wrote instead a half an hour sermon, which is also a chapter analysis, but with only key verses included. Then at about 2 a.m. yesterday, I woke up in a cold sweat and spontaneously wrote the sermon I'll be presenting today instead, which is much shorter. So you're welcome for that. Hopefully you won't be bored to tears in only 15 minutes. So I wanted to talk today about the book of Ecclesiastes, mostly for its personal meaning, but also its unique ability to instruct the faithful on the content of a faithless life. I spent a couple of years as an atheist between uh, the ages of 18 to 20. Not a lot of Bible reading went on then. But it was this description of Ecclesiastes, heard at the age of 20, which made me pick up the Bible for the first time as an adult in earnest. It's a funny book. Solomon goes on and on about how meaningless everything is, then slips in obey God at the end, almost as a formality. It struck me at first as a funny book as well, but my mind's changed as to its meaning over the writing of this sermon and the years. I view Ecclesiastes as step one, an instruction manual of moving from a faithless life into a faithful one. This step constitutes describing and refuting the content of a faithless life. And that's what I wanted to preach on today, proving the meaninglessness of a faithless life via Ecclesiastes. For context, Solomon spends Ecclesiastes describing life under the sun or under the heavens, meaning a worldly life absent our understanding of God. In Solomon's time, he didn't have access to the books of the Bible, except for the five books of Moses, plus Joshua, Judges, probably the books of Samuel, and many of the Psalms, and that's it. Christ was yet to come. The afterlife and the laws by which we judge for entrance into heaven were unknown to him. The book of Ecclesiastes should be viewed as an argument. Solomon's argument is that from birth to death, absent a God who has made a connection with his creations, life is a joke, a trick, not of lasting profit or goodness, empty, trivial, and finite. In other words, meaningless. What is above is unknown to Solomon in his time. He sets himself a task, therefore, to study and explore by wisdom all that takes place under the sun. He chooses to know what he can know. And he begins Ecclesiastes with his conclusion. From chapter 1, verse 2, Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I'm always reminded upon reading the first chapter of Ecclesiastes of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and that is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Solomon was in a unique position and of a unique character to make this argument. He was king in Jerusalem. It's said of him that he possessed wealth unfathomable and illegal to us now. As king, the products of dominion were his to claim. Anything he wanted in Jerusalem could be his if he wished it. Not only did he possess wealth, but in his own words, increased in wisdom more than anyone who ruled over Jerusalem. In Kings, Solomon is described as the wisest man in all the land. This would be from Kings 4, 29 to 34. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes around 935 BC, roughly near the end of his 40-year reign. Solomon provides many proofs for the meaninglessness of life under the sun. Chief among them is the common destiny of all, death. But many on earth still convince themselves that life has meaning even in the face of death. Life for the faithless or the worldly is justified commonly via pleasure, wealth, legacy, heritage, knowledge, and wisdom. Solomon addresses all of these and refutes them. Now I'd like to add before I continue that there is nothing wrong with also living for these things in part as faithful people, as long as the place for them is beneath Christ and not of a sinful nature. 
on legacy and heritage. Solomon begins Ecclesiastes with a refutation of these things via a basic proof from 111. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I can't say I know the content of my ancestors' lives even 10 generations back. So it is with my ancestors, it will be with me. Yet still the worldly man longs to be remembered, to never be forgotten, even in infamy. Many tools are wielded by the worldly man towards his end, chiefly one's craft. Solomon counters this as well. Time, one of our earthly masters, robs us eventually of all achievements. But in, even in the earthly sense, your craft is likely meaningless from 4-4. And I saw that all toil and all achievement sprung from one person's envy of another from 4-6. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. So often man robs himself of life's joy by our quest for improvement. The highest order craft is found in invention. For the end of an earthly legacy, there's nothing better. Someone's legacy in the form of character is soon lost, but what is invented persists for some time. Solomon counters this too in 1.9. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. From verse 10, is there anything of which one can say, look, this is new? It was here already, long ago. Inventions are mere discoveries, soon forgotten and soon remembered. This too is meaningless. on wisdom and knowledge. As there's no outside perspective afforded to the worldly man, he must create an afterlife, an eternity to ultimately justify a legacy. But he cannot do so by wisdom or the intellect. There is nothing in the order of things which details the word of God. How do earthly people use wisdom and knowledge? A worldly man seeks wisdom and knowledge to give himself advantage and comfort. And Solomon affirms the advantage. He says, wisdom is more powerful than weapons of war, makes a man more powerful than ten rulers. Wisdom is a shelter. It gives great earthly advantage from chapter 7. But Solomon still refers to it as meaningless because it cannot be used to discern from the material world the meaning of life and death. He has this to say of one of his attempts to pull the transcendent from dust. 319, surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. From 321, who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. He attempted to discern from the animal kingdom man's place in God's kingdom but could not discern the direction of spirits. Solomon laments consistently that he couldn't pull from the order of things an answer to a purpose to life. From 8.17 he says, No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. Wisdom, therefore, is meaningless. It provides no abiding advantage and has strict limits. The pursuit of wisdom for comfort or worldly affirmation is also a dead end. As in 1.18, with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. He counseled throughout Ecclesiastes to be happy, to try to find satisfaction in what you do, as there isn't anything else to find on earth. All other worldly alternatives are beneath this on pleasure and wealth. Of this happiness, it is not pleasure he speaks of. Pleasure is the most obvious thing wielded by worldly people to justify their lives. It is nothing but a fleeting distraction, however, according to Solomon. Pleasure is something explored by Solomon extensively throughout his life. He says this of pleasure in chapter 2, verses 2 to 9. Solomon used his wealth and position to undertake great projects. He built houses, planted vineyards, made gardens, parks, reservoirs, and planted fruit trees. He purchased men and women and owned more herds than any in Jerusalem before him. He amassed silver, gold, great treasure, singers, and a harem. Solomon says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. 
It is said in Kings 11.3, he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. You could call these projects also an attempt to find meaning by legacy through the lasting creation of things, but he found it was all vanity, a chasing after the wind. The content of a faithless life looks exactly like this, 6, 7. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. The earthly man wants for something more. He gains that thing, then he wants for something more again. This is the idiot cycle of the worldly man. I spent my youth reading philosophy, exploring the common desires, lusting for wealth, and they're much the same as Solomon. Even the vitalist philosophies which captured me in my youth were just detailing the best ways to enjoy life, absent a true, transcendent meaning. So what has Solomon said against pleasure, wealth, legacy, heritage, knowledge, and wisdom? Death and time take it all in the end. I'll end this section on Solomon's proofs with Ozymandias by Percy Shelley, as it summarizes better than I could. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survived stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. On faith. Solomon, throughout Ecclesiastes, counsels man to be happy when he can, to simplify one's life towards this end and preserve life, to cram as much happiness in there as possible. But living for happiness is flawed. We know what we need as followers of Christ, and it is not more happiness. The first step in any Christian's journey is to recognize the need for something which can't be obtained by earthly means. There is a God-shaped hole in your heart that needs filling. Solomon attempts to teach us what we and the rest of mankind are, prideful things driven by impulses which deliver no lasting profit. But our lives are redeemed. The Messiah has come. What is meaningless to the worldly man can be meaningful to us. We can find proof of this in our reading of Ephesians. Paul, through Christ, begins his prayer by affirming the connection between heaven and earth. Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Meaning is breathed into power. Power is given to us to understand the depth of God's love. It feels as if Paul is speaking to Solomon in this passage in particular to know this love which surpasses knowledge. Solomon's knowledge, the root of his wisdom, is beneath Christ's love, which Solomon could not understand in his earthly life. Solomon's hierarchy was foolishness, then wisdom, and we know now both are beneath the love of Christ. The connection God has with us justifies our earthly existence. Nothing we do is meaningless. And I'm using the word here to mean finite. We know that what we do on earth builds a bridge to an eternity with God or burns that bridge. Nothing could be more meaningful. Solomon ends Ecclesiastes with a powerful command to fear God and keep his commandments. Despite the meaninglessness of life, despite the fact that Solomon did not know Christ, he strikes me as a man who knew something quite deeply. The only hope a man who cannot know the Messiah has is to know his coming and act accordingly. I'd like to finish the sermon with a verse from Matthew 7:14. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Why is it that straight is the gate and narrow is the way? Because everything but the way of Christ is meaningless. Let us pray. My Lord God, the distractions of the world are great. 
So often we confuse what is earthly with what is meaningful. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom of Solomon, for knowledge of life's meaning apart from you. And thank you, Lord, for the narrow way you've given us out of a meaningless life. Give to us the strength to walk it. Amen.